Elon Musk has an undeniably ambitious plan to colonize Mars. He's even built a massive spaceship unlike anything we've seen before to make it happen. The vision is bold and inspiring, but when it comes to the finer details, the physics, engineering, and logistics, much still remains unclear. Experts have pointed out several critical flaws that raise serious concerns about its feasibility. So what exactly isn't working with SpaceX's current approach to colonizing Mars, and how could we make it more viable? Let's dive into all of that today. The person who recently pointed out major flaws in SpaceX's Mars colonization plan is Dr. Robert Zubrin. He is the president of Pioneer Astronautics, an aerospace R&D company based in Lakewood, Colorado, and the founder and president of the Mars Society, an international organization dedicated to advancing the exploration and settlement of Mars through both public and private efforts. Zubrin has been studying human missions to Mars for decades, long before Elon Musk publicly declared his ambitions for the Red Planet. With that kind of background, his critiques are not something to dismiss lightly. So what exactly is wrong with Musk's current Mars plan? According to Musk, one of the main goals of colonizing Mars is to create a self-sustaining metropolis that will preserve the light of consciousness in the event of a catastrophe on Earth. His vision involves launching thousands of starships to rapidly transport a million people to Mars. But Zubrin argues that this vision is fundamentally flawed. A human civilization on Mars cannot be established in the manner of the D-Day landings, by dropping hundreds of thousands of settlers onto a hostile shore all at once. During the Normandy invasion, Allied troops could be continually supplied from nearby England via Liberty ships carrying 10,000 tons of cargo each across a short channel in a matter of hours. In stark contrast, each starship will be able to carry only about 100 tons of cargo to Mars and the journey takes six to eight months, one way. This means that any large-scale Martian settlement would be extremely difficult, if not impossible, to support from Earth. For such a colony to succeed, the infrastructure to feed, clothe, house, and support its population must already be in place. That means developing agriculture and industry on Mars before large numbers of people arrive. In Zubrin's view, Mars must be settled organically, much like the early settlement of America. Small groups of pioneers would first establish farms and basic industries, laying the foundation for gradually larger waves of settlers. Furthermore, he argues, it's unlikely that a Martian civilization would begin as a million-person metropolis. Historically, cities of that size only became common after the invention of long-distance transportation systems like railroads. On Mars, it's more realistic to expect many smaller towns spread across the planet, each strategically located near different resources, with populations ranging from a few thousand to perhaps 50,000, similar to Renaissance Florence, which served as a cultural hub in its time. Finally, Zubrin emphasizes that no Martian civilization, regardless of its size, could survive the complete collapse of civilization on Earth. High-tech societies depend on a vast and complex division of labor, something that cannot be instantly replicated off-world. As Zubrin puts it, we are not going to Mars to abandon humanity. We are going to Mars to strengthen it, to vastly expand our capacity to face future challenges by creating new, highly inventive branches of civilization. Now, let's get into some of the more technical aspects of SpaceX's Mars mission plan. According to SpaceX, the mission would begin by launching a starship into low Earth orbit, carrying around 100 tons of cargo. Once in orbit, it would be refueled with approximately 600 tons of methane and liquid oxygen, delivered by six additional tanker starships. With this fuel, Starship could begin a six-month conjunction class trajectory to Mars, aero break into Martian orbit, and land on the surface. After landing, Starship would serve as a habitat for a sizable crew for about a year and a half. During that time, it would be refueled using resources found on Mars, Specifically, propellant would be produced by extracting carbon dioxide from the Martian atmosphere and combining it with water through the Sabatier reaction, yielding roughly 600 tons of methane and oxygen. This would be enough to power the return trip to Earth, carrying the crew and about 10 tons of cargo. There are clear advantages to this approach. Using a single spacecraft for the entire mission reduces complexity and streamlines planning and operations. The payload capacity is also enormous compared to competing designs. While Musk envisions eventually sending 100 settlers per flight, that figure is not practical for initial missions. However, a crew of around 20 people could reasonably be accommodated. That's about four times larger than what most other Mars mission concepts propose. Importantly, all of these crew members would land on Mars, where they could actively contribute to exploration efforts, benefit from gravity, and receive better radiation protection than they would in orbit. This is a major departure from traditional NASA-style missions, which often leave part of the crew in orbit aboard a mothership. In those cases, astronauts in orbit spend extended periods in zero gravity exposed to cosmic radiation, often with little to do except monitor systems. SpaceX's concept avoids that by keeping the entire crew on the surface where they're more useful and better protected.
The mission also avoids the need for complex Mars orbit rendezvous maneuvers on the return trip, which significantly reduces risk. However, as promising as this plan sounds, Zubrin highlights some major technical hurdles, particularly with Starship size and the demands of producing return fuel on Mars. To manufacture the necessary 600 metric tons of propellant in just 18 months, a constant power output of around 600 kilowatts would be needed. Meeting that demand with solar energy would require an array covering roughly 60,000 square meters, an area larger than 13 football fields, and weighing about 240 metric tons. Just transporting that infrastructure to Mars would require at least three separate Starship launches. Deploying and maintaining such a massive solar farm on the Martian surface would also be an enormous challenge. Zubrin argues that a far more practical solution would be to use nuclear power. A compact nuclear reactor could provide the required energy without the need for sprawling solar arrays. But there's a complication. Nuclear reactors suitable for space flight require highly enriched uranium or plutonium, materials that are tightly controlled due to their dual-use nature. That means government involvement is not just likely, but essential. We're talking about putting nuclear reactors on another planet. This isn't something private companies can handle alone, nor should they. So what does Zubrin propose instead? His suggestion is to start smaller, specifically with a new vehicle he calls the Starboat. The idea is to take SpaceX's current Starship design and scale it down by about a factor of five in mass. Despite its smaller size, this scaled-down vehicle could address many of the weaknesses in SpaceX's existing Mars mission architecture. The advantages begin with flexibility. A starboat could return directly from the Martian surface to Earth using just 120 tons of propellant. Alternatively, it could perform a rendezvous in low Mars orbit with only 50 tons of propellant, allowing a single orbital tanker to support up to five such return flights. It could also be launched into Earth orbit fully fueled by a single starship and sent directly to Mars with five tons of cargo without any need for Earth orbit refueling. With just one in-orbit refueling, it could carry 25 tons. This sharply contrasts with the current SpaceX plan, which requires launching seven full-size starships, the mission vehicle plus six tankers, within a single launch window to support one flight. If the starboat were used as the interplanetary transport, the crew size would have to be reduced from 20 to around four or five. That reduction, Zubrin argues, is actually more fitting for early missions, which will be focused on laying the groundwork before a full base infrastructure is in place. Another possible configuration would be to station a full-sized crewed starship in Mars orbit and use the starboat purely as a shuttle between the surface and orbit. In that case, the mission could still carry a 20-person crew and 100 tons of cargo to the surface using the standard starship. The smaller starboat would only be used for the relatively short ascent from Mars back to orbit meaning the crew would only have to endure tighter quarters during the brief return segment. Because of its reduced size, the starboat could make that ascent using just 40 tons of propellant, far more efficient than using a full-size starship for the same task. Beyond interplanetary missions, the starboat could serve a wide range of additional roles. It could act as the upper stage of a reusable launch system in the same class as Falcon 9, Neutron, or New Glenn, making it a key part of a medium-lift architecture for various support missions. Its reusability and smaller size make it a highly versatile asset across both Earth and Mars operations. Perhaps even more critically, the starboat would provide Mars crews with global mobility. Mars has as much surface area as all of Earth's continents combined. Relying solely on slow-moving ground vehicles with limited range won't be enough for serious exploration. To effectively explore a planet of this scale, rapid long-distance travel is essential. With 50, or ideally 100, tons of propellant, the starboat could enable high-speed transport across continental distances, opening up far more of the planet for exploration. If additional starships were landed to serve as refueling bases at strategic locations across the planet, this mobility could be expanded even further. Zubrin estimates that with just nine such refueling stations, the entire Martian surface could become accessible to human explorers. So what do you think? Is Zubrin's approach more plausible than the current SpaceX plan? Or do you believe Musk's vision is already achievable? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. There are many reasons to explore Mars. One of the most important is the scientific value of the planet itself. Mars and early Earth share many similarities. And for decades, scientists have considered Mars one of the most promising places to search for life beyond our world. But the search for life, past or present, won't be easy. Hunting for fossils on Mars will involve the same kinds of tasks it does on Earth, 
hiking long distances over rough terrain, following subtle geological clues, digging through rock with pickaxes and shovels, and carefully exposing tiny signs of life embedded in layers of ancient sediment. If we hope to find current life, it will require an even greater effort, setting up drilling rigs capable of reaching kilometers beneath the surface to access underground aquifers, retrieving samples and analyzing them in a fully equipped lab on Mars. These aren't tasks robots can do, not now and not for a long time. Only human explorers, with their judgment, flexibility, and experience, can take on challenges like these. If we don't go, we won't know. Beyond science, a human mission to Mars has the potential to inspire a generation. In the 1960s, the Apollo program doubled the number of science and engineering graduates in the United States. Those young minds helped spark the computer revolution and countless other breakthroughs, repaying the cost of Apollo many times over. Like individuals, nations grow when they dare to do hard things and stagnate when they don't. Among all the worlds beyond Earth that are within reach, Mars remains the best candidate for long-term human settlement. It has abundant water resources, including deep underground reservoirs, massive ice glaciers, and continent-sized regions of frozen mud containing between 5 and 60 percent water by weight. Despite its thin atmosphere, Mars still offers natural radiation protection equivalent to about 65 centimeters of water, enough to shield astronauts from solar flares and to support thin-walled greenhouses that can grow crops under natural sunlight thanks to the planet's Earth-like 24-hour day. Mars is not only within our reach, it is ready for us. With the right strategy, the right tools, and the will to go, humans can explore it, study it, and eventually call it home. Mars can be settled, and it should be. So, all right, let's get it done.